come tonight from all over the country to rendezvous here. And I give you a warm welcome. And on your behalf, I sent a message to our king. And I want to read you the answer he sent. The, the sixth anniversary of LMA. And it is marked, it is marked by two changes at our reunion, which are not accidental. We've got here tonight, as our guest of honor, Mr. Lewis Douglas, the American ambassador. <laughs> is something more than an anniversary of a past victory or an opportunity for old friends to meet once more. Now, what was the secret of those desert days? I think... <coughs> there was the feeling of unity and the unselfishness and the sense of duty which existed everywhere. Wherever you were, you knew you could rely on the man next to you. We were conscious that we were all one, and that spirit pervaded everybody. And it united and made one with us, the men from the Dominions, the Indians, and the men from East and West Africa. Now, looking back, looking back on those days, <clears throat> I believe that the true symbol of the desert was the tow rope. You see, <clears throat> Now, many of you, many of you must have felt that if only that spirit and the true understanding that it bred between so many peoples of different outlook and different race and different color during the war, we saw what can be achieved when nations cooperate for a common purpose. But when the war was ended, there appeared to be no unity of purpose. Individuals and nations began to think and act in accordance with their own interests. We began to pursue material advantages, and this led to a, a materialistic disregard for spiritual values, and the high resolve and the calm and steady resolution of the war years seemed to pass away. And so today, we find that abroad, the prospect is dark, dark and troubled. And at home, I would say that the true strength of Britain, it lies in its men and women. It lies, in fact, in you. And the message of this reunion that I give you is this. Be true. Be true to ourselves as we were in the desert. And if we do that, then we will triumph over our present difficulties as we overcame those in the desert. And that, that is why admission has been extended to cover your wives and your friends. You, for though there were few Americans present at Alamein, apart from the, the gallant members of the American Friends Ambulance, although there were few Americans at Alamein, yet they also were present with us in spirit. And they too share not only our language, but our ideals. <laughs> Cooperation with that great American nation that the hope, the hope of the whole free world depends. And so, I am very glad indeed to have the American ambassador here with us tonight, and I now introduce him to you to speak to us. <laughs> taken careful note of the two departures from the customary practices of the Alamein reunion to which Lord Montgomery has referred. The presence of men who with their comrades from all parts of the empire and all members of the commonwealth 
played such a notable role in one of the most telling military operations in the annals of warfare. And grateful because he has been, for this evening, admitted to this goodly fellowship of British fighting men, brought together by your leader in many battles, Lord Montgomery, between two continents. When you held within your grasp the link in the chain which bound the east to the west. When you alone, standing on the battlements of the Middle East and Africa, were the last defenders of that strategic area, which because it was the gateway between the European theater and the operations in the Pacific and in Asia, was as significant to us as it was important to our enemies. Had you men of Alamein not propel the enemy's lunge at Suez. Had you men of Alamein faltered and failed to hold this bridge, to maintain this link, to preserve this causeway, had the naval forces of Japan, three of the combined chiefs of staff, settling their differences by the forging of fact and the force of argument and persuasion, agreeing to far-flung strategic plans, distributing combined military resources throughout the world to meet the pattern of strategy and the design of tactical operations, uniting on a combined command in the field, which operated with as little regard for national pride as it did for flag or uniform. This story, this story constitutes one of the most thrilling and glorious chapters in the chronicles of nations. See, instead, the world tending to become divided. And there are some who would attempt to describe this state of affairs as a struggle for power between my own country and another lying to the east. There could be no more spurious and no more false definition than this. The people of the United States, of my country, seek no man's territory. We entertain no ambitions to impose our will on others. We have no design to fashion other lands in our own image. We desire no less than you the preservation of those essential liberties of man which permit him to develop according to his own talents, to contribute to the well-being of himself, his family, and his community to add to the accumulated knowledge in the arts and in the sciences.